I sat there watching, I'm wondering which one are going to be the ministers next that are going downstairs and they will be, be here. Uh, I want to speak for just a moment before Brother Bill comes with his message. We are studying in our Sunday school class about a Christian and a religion, and it is very important that we know what it is we're supposed to be doing. And, and as I said to each of those this morning, I thank them for coming. I praise you for coming here today, for caring enough about your life, for caring enough about Christ that you come and want to hear his word spoken. There's a verse in the Bible that uh, in the 14th chapter of Proverbs, in the 12th, and it's also in the 16th and 20th, I think, the same book. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If what we are doing doesn't match the scripture, it could be the ways of death for us. And a little verse, I, I had gotten this gospel uh, minute out the other night and read it sometimes it might be a week before I get to them sometimes it might be three months uh, but this scripture that it gives here and it talks about is Isaiah 28 and 20 and you're going to say man that's a weird verse you're going to read to me it says for the bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself on it and the covering narrow than he can wrap himself in it well, what's that have to do with anything? But if you ever, you know, at home, sometimes we get these little blankets, and, and I can identify with this, or little crows or something, and I'm kind of tall, and they don't cover my feet and all the way up as far as I want them above my head sometimes, and it's uncomfortable. And we've got a couch, and sometimes it has stuff on it, and then we've got a love seat, and I lay down on it, and it's just not long enough for my legs, and it's not comfortable. So I'm laying on this love seat, that's not long enough, and I've got this little troll that's not long enough, or big enough to go around me, it's not comfortable. But you see, sometimes in life, we're not comfortable with the way we're living our life, and we don't know that we need to do something about that. We don't know that God has a better plan for us and that he is maybe making us miserable or maybe the things that we're searching out aren't the things, isn't the avenue that we need to look for to make us happy in this life. The person in this text here, he says, when you are tired and weary and looking forward to a restful night, there are few things worse than a bed that provides misery instead of rest. And frustration rather than peace and comfort. A bed too short to stretch out on and cover too narrow to wrap around. One would spend a miserable night indeed, but look at his point. Those who trust in and live for the wrong things are doomed to live a life of misery and unrest. Why? Because those things, aren't, those things are a bed too short and a cover too narrow. They may offer promise of rest and peace and satisfaction, but their promise is empty. There is no fulfillment in them. <coughs> we need to set our eyes on spiritual things sometimes. And when we're seeking out the things of the world to find comfort in, there may be comfort there for a short time. But we must endure as Christians, and we are in this for the long haul, and we must be looking at the things that Christ has for us to do. We must be in the Word. At this time, brother... Billy with message. You brought us on. You will turn your up to 350 and lay them to the side of you a song of invitation this morning. I can welcome everyone here at uh, Church of Christ at Lacey Creek. We're all here for a reason to learn more about God's Word and become better servants of Him. Morning, if you want to turn with me to Genesis chapter 4, that's where I'll be reading from. I got to thinking lately, you know, last, last but most of you know, last uh, fall, whatever, we lost lost a good brother-in-law, Jan Dillon, cancer. And I got thinking, you know, he's a pretty good brother-in-law. He used to work on my vehicle all the time, never charged me a dime. A lot of times he wouldn't even charge me for the parts, let alone the labor. He just fix it for free, just show up and come over and... You know, now I got vehicle problems. I gotta go pay a mechanic ninety dollars an hour to get it fixed. And all these got me to thinking, why does bad things happen to good people? You 
seems like more and more you read in the news, you see a drunk driver kills a Christian woman and six kids. And you think, what's going on there? You see all this other stuff going on in our world today, and it looks like Satan is just running rampant. And you wonder why all the bad things are happening to us. And we just keep wondering about that. And I read a little article that said, In a terminal offense post, Alan Emery tells of a company businessman, uh, Ken Hansen, to visit a hospitalized employee. The patient lay very still, his eyes conveying anguish. His operation had taken eight hours, and recovery was long and uncertain. Alex, said Ken quietly, you know I have had a number of serious operations. I know the pain of trying to talk, and I know there are no the questions you're asking. There are two verses I want to give you, Genesis 42:36 and Romans 8, 28. We have the option of these two attitudes, but we need the perspective of the latter. Hansen turned to the passages and read them and then prayed and left. The young man, Alex Bob, took the message to heart. He later enjoyed full recovery. Every day we choose one of these attitudes in life, amid life's difficulties. We choose to be beat up or to be upbeat. We say with Jacob in Genesis 42, 36, all these things are against me. Or we say to, with Paul in Romans 8, 28, all these things are working together for good to those who love the Lord. We can also read in Matthew 5.45, he talks about loving your enemies and things, and he says, he goes on to say that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. But all too often we focus on the wrong one. We focus on all the rain on us and all the sunshine on the, on the evil of the world. All too often we don't choose, as he says there, we choose to be beat up and be victims of sins, to be upbeat and be victorious. For in John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you, that you might have peace. In this world you shall have, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. The words of Jesus Christ. We, we have that today in our own self. If we live in Christ and we have Christ in us, we know we have overcome this world. We should be of good cheer. We will still have tribulation. He told us so. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. We will have trials. We will have sickness. We will have death. Unless we die before <laughs> other people die before us, we're going to grieve our lost loved ones. We've got five stages of grief that most people go through. They go through denial when something happens. You find out you got cancer or something to that effect, and you deny it. Well, no, I don't have that. Then you get angry. And everybody don't know how to deal with that anger. And sometimes we don't realize we can be angry with God. He says be angry and sin not. It's what we do with that anger that hurts us the worst. It's whether we sin with that anger or not. It's our choice to be upbeat or to be beat up. We can get angry at God, but we don't have to sin. We can be like Job. I was going to go to Job today, but then the Bible, and everybody came with the Bible Bowl, and I was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to go to Job, and then some other verses, and God give me some other messages and lead me in a different direction here, and that's why I want to go to chapter 4 in Genesis. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and buried Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again buried his brother Abel, and Abel was the keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, send life at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against, his, against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? 
Thy voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord saith unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, and lest any finding him should kill him. So let's take this from another point of view, what we just read. Let's think about Eve for a minute. How does this make it feel to her? She's lost a son, been murdered by her other son, whom she would have loved as well. But now, how does that seem fair? No courts can try, Cain. Not only that, God said, I'm going to protect you, Cain. I'm going to put a mark on you, lest anybody touch you. And you're going to, vengeance is going to be mine, says the Lord. I'm going to put a mark on you. You're going to be protected. The murderer of her own son, which was her son, another one of her sons, but you got to think about it. Was that fair? Was that truly fair? To let this man live after he took the life of his brother. What pain and suffering he must have went through to deal with this. <laughs> then I got to think about others in the Bible. You know, I don't know that they mention their mom. His mom and his name, but I read in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 and 29 of this man who received 40 stripes minus one. He's in prison several times. He was beaten with rods three times, stoned once, shipwrecked several times. He was in perils of robbers, his countrymen, his city, his wilderness, the sea, false brethren, he was cold and hungry, thirst and naked. And he went by the name of Foster Paul. But to his parents, would that have seemed fair? That he had to go through all this. But for what reason? A lot of times we have trials and tribulations. Let's, let's remember Romans 8, 28. It's all good. All for the good of the Lord and His plan for us. There's another person I'd like to think of. Another woman in the Bible I can remember. Angels announced that she was pregnant. Her son went through life and made many friends. Went doing good. And yet in the end, his friends forsake him. He's all alone. He was mocked. He was beaten. And later crucified and hung on an old rugged cross for our sins. Does that seem fair this morning to us? How minor our, tri our trials and tribulations should be compared to those. But he done it because he loved us. He loved us that much that he went to the cross for our sins. Not for nothing he did. His father even forsaken him and left him there. He could have called legions and legions of angels down and that could have been the end of it. And we would still be lost and not have eternity. But God loved us so much that he did send Jesus down, his only son, to live a life of good. Give us an example of how we should be, even though he had trials and tribulations. Pharisees was always trying to trip him up. It was always after him. And the world thought they'd won. But they did. The world and the devil thought they won when they put him on the old rugged cross. But God had a better plan. He had a plan of salvation for us. It was so in the beginning. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today. And tomorrow. I'd like to real quickly read Romans 8 28. We'll turn there. Because we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All things. 
even though I might not understand why my brother-in-law had to die, I know it was for the good of God. God made all things work together for good for him. For those who love him. He started his plan of salvation thousands and thousands of years ago before I was ever here. Because he loved me. He loved me and cared enough to die for me that I may live eternity with him if I obey his commands. He took out of dust and breathed air and breathed life into it. He said, let me make man in my own image. He loved us enough to create us in his own image. Then he put, him to sleep. He put Adam to sleep and took a rib from Adam and made woman so he'd have a helper. So in that, in that instance, the one flesh became <coughs> sin. And then when, you, when man and woman comes back together, the two become one again as God has designed it. <coughs> And then he gave them a garden. And he gave them offspring. And he goes right on down to the flood. And then the promises that God gives Abraham <coughs> the seed of Jesus Christ. But it's all for it's all for our benefit to help us grow to be better Christians and learn how to serve him better. That's why we have these trials and tribulations. It's all for good, all for good for God's plan. We may not see that. I don't know the big picture. I can't see all the big picture. I don't know how many people might have been saved because of the way, the way Jeff lived his life and accepted Christ. I don't know. Or maybe how you're having your trials and tribulations through sickness, what may be happening to somebody's witnessing to you, or you maybe you're witnessing to somebody else. But we need to be ready. We need to be ready to give that account. I mean, I know last month I found myself unready to give that account. Because I didn't know how to answer the question of what I'm trying to answer here today for you. Why we have trials and tribulations. Why good, bad things happen to good people. A lady at a restaurant came to me. She seen I was wearing a Christian t-shirt that had all these Christian scriptures on it. And she walked up and asked me, and she's, you're a Christian. And she didn't speak real good English, but she spoke it well enough I could understand her. And I said, yes. And then she goes, on, well, I don't know. Do I need to go to church? I'm kind of mad at God. I lost my son. And I really didn't know how to answer that until so I started studying for this and learned that all things were together <coughs> for good. As long as they love God, they are called according to His purpose. We're all called. But we've got a choice. Evil started back in the, Eve, in, in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had a choice. God said, here's all the food. Eat whatever you want, but don't touch this tree right here. And so many times we want to focus, what a serpent trick the woman, and the woman tricked Adam. No, Satan tricked them both. They was both there. I don't think Adam was over here and Eve was over here, and she snuck around and it and then ran over here to Adam. Adam knew everything was going on in the garden. I'm sure he was right there. And he didn't step up. He didn't step up and say, no, wait a minute, Eve, don't eat that. God said no. He sat there and got to see this way. So many times we do the same thing. We talk about pure religion in Sunday school this morning. So many times we sit around and we let ourselves be deceived. We let ourselves be tricked on different items in our life. Some of the choices we make, that's what causes some of these bad things that happen to us. Not that any of us are so bad that we go out and do stuff that causes maybe cancer. But we can't smoke. We find out smoking causes cancer. So if you smoked and you got cancer. There's other reasons why you might get cancer. There's other reasons why you might be sick. Different diseases. We're all going to get old. <coughs> Jesus don't come back before we die. We're all going to die. But just these songs talked about this morning. Where can we go to the Lord? Where can we, where can we find the peace to the Lord? His Word through Jesus Christ, who has overcome this world. We need to worship Him and study His Word to be more noble than the ones that test the mic or be like the breeze. Do what He said in 2 Timothy uh, 2.15, I think it is. Study to show yourself approved, the workman unto God, need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. How many of us this morning can divide this, rightly divide this Word of Truth? I try to flip through here and find verses that 
None of us probably don't know nothing about. Me included. My brother Thomas spoke this morning, but my fat ball brother James Collins he always said when you point the finger, you got these pointing back at you. Me included. I don't study enough. And I hope this morning by going over this that, that, I, that I've explained it enough and you can understand why bad things happen. And who you can find peace in. Who you can go to when you have trials and tribulations. Don't go to the world who will give you Burger King answers and give it to you your way. Do what, do what you want. Do it your way. Here's the way I fix it. Go to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It says, I have overcome the world. That he set aside a mansion for us. That we obey him. And keep his commands to the end. If we endure to the end, he says, I have a mansion for you. You can come home. I'm going to call you home. But you got to endure to the end. It doesn't matter who you are. you got to go through the same path. It don't matter if you're Donald Trump. You know, the beggar down here on, in, on, in West Liberty here somewhere. Everyone's got to go through the cross. That's what I love about God's plan of salvation. We're all equal when it comes to his plan of salvation. It don't matter if I'm Julius Randle and I'm going to score 40 points today in the ball game, and everybody goes, woo-hoo, he's a hero. He's going to go on and maybe win the whole championship. It don't matter. Because when it comes to the cross, he's got to come the same way I do, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Two thousand years ago, for yours and my sins, for each and every one of us, He's made a way and He's prepared a place for us. But we have to choose. We have to choose as Cain and Abel. God told him to choose. It been Cain could have simply went and said, "God, I messed up. Let me fix this with you." But sin was waiting right here for his other choice. We both have that same choice this morning. To choose God or to choose Satan. We get ourselves deceived so many times. We look around and we focus in on, like I said earlier, we're talking about, we look around and it's raining over here on us. Oh, we got all these bad things going wrong. We look over here and this person over here living, looks like they're living the life of Riley. They, they're drinking it up, boozing up, partying all the time. But yet they're sitting there blind and deceived. They're in the cell, the prison cell is seeing the doors wide open for now. <coughs> the devil says, Well, I need to lock a door on them. I've already got them fooled. They're already going to hell with me. A place that God prepared for me and my, my angels, and I'm taking all these people with me. And they're already going. And the door's wide open. They can walk out any time. Any time they can take that choice and say, Oh, I need away from this lifestyle. I need to give my life to Christ and to live obedient to the end. Sometimes as Christians, we get ourselves in a little box. and we, we do the same thing. We deceive ourselves. We don't look for the exits when it comes time for trials and temptations. We look at God and say, well, you know, God, Solomon asked for wisdom, and you just poured it out. And then you just done all this other. Well, it's God's world. God can do what he wants with it. He's a wonderful, amazing God, a loving God. Think how much power he has. See that he just breathes life into the whole universe instantaneously. All at one time, he just spoke words and there was the universe. There was a world. There was water. There was life. He made man of his own image. So we'd be obedient to him and return back to him. And I'm glad to see everyone here today that's here. I thank you for being here. Thank you for hearing this message. I just wish more people would could be here that's lost and to hear this message. Jesus Christ is the, they need Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. So many times people they go through grief, they go through the anger, I'm talking about denial, the anger, and they get mad at God and they say, Oh, God, why did you let this happen? I prayed and prayed. And then they just get mad and pick up the Bible and throw it away so there must be no count because God didn't answer my prayer. Well, he didn't answer maybe the way you wanted him to answer it. 
when we taught the praise, I was doing our name, and I keep telling them, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know in heaven, by reading through the scriptures, that his will is constantly being done there. And that's what we say we want here, but really we don't. The reason our prayers are not answered, we, I think it's in James, I'm not really sure where the scripture is, but I remember it says, you have not because you ask not, or you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own desires, your own lust. Granted, I see every one of you here, and I don't want none of you to die. I would, I would pray that you wouldn't, but I know that's going to be a fact of life I'm going to have to deal with. If I live long enough to see each and one of every one of you pass on before me, or if the Lord comes back and the world is over, and that's it. The fact that life I'm like to deal with. But I would hope that I wouldn't have to deal with it. No one in my soul. I didn't at least mention Jesus to you as Lord and Savior. And I hope each and every one of you feel the same way and you take it out in the workplace, in the schools, and wherever you go throughout this week and you feel the same way and you get fired up for the Lord and you get out there and you want to do the same. There's so much evil out there. We don't take time. I'm too busy. I want to watch UK play ball. I'm too busy. I got this other thing I want to do. <coughs> You know, I was wrapped up in my own world, and when that lady came to me at that restaurant that day, I was too busy for her. And I often pray if it's ever God's will that I can, I can go back to that restaurant, or go back to maybe she moved to another restaurant. And I, and I can set things right with her, and help her with, it, with this word. And if not, I hope and pray that God sends somebody else to be a little bit more prepared than I was. So many times we're just wrapped up in our sails. That's all we think about is our own righteousness, our own self, our own self. We think we're self-righteous. We think our deeds will get us into heaven. We need deeds. We need faith without works is dead. We know that. James said it in, in the book of James. Just as the spirit without the body is dead, so is faith without works. <coughs> but our works ain't going to get us there unless we've accepted Christ. Unless we've heard the word. Jesus Christ. And we believe on Him. And then we go and repent of our sins. And then we come forward and we confess Him as our Lord and Savior. And then we get in that baptism and we are buried in baptism with Him. And arise a new creature and endure to the end. So we've done all those steps. All those works are meaningless. I heard a pastor this week he talking about a guy at his church Came to the church, put in the septic system, and they're building the church. Done it all for free. And never stepped inside of that church since, from the day it's been built, 30 years ago. And he said, I just hope and pray that, you know, he's talked to him several times and tried to get him to understand that wasn't enough. Doing those good works was great, it was a great thing. But it's meaningless if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life. It's going to be meaningless on the day of judgment. Jesus Christ ain't standing there saying, God, my blood covers him. God, my blood covers this one. God, my blood has covered the sins of this one. Because if not, Satan can be saying, yep, you're mine, you're mine, let's all go over here. But it ain't going to be a big party like we, like we envision, like we see on TV, like we see at the movies, or wherever. We have to be careful when we go to these movies and these different shows and things we watch. They try to pollute our mind with other ideals. But don't thus say the word of God. They sound good. Hollywood's got something they want us to believe. But if we do find good movies and good and good music and things that we really enjoy, we should support those. Doing the work of God. We should support those. Let, let, let's let the world know who we are. Let's quit letting one atheist stand up. And saying, oh, God offends me, take it off the money, take prayer out of schools. Let us stand forth for God. He loved us that much. Shouldn't we do the same for Him? I'd like to read another verse, James chapter 1, verses uh, 3 and 4. It says, 
knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Yeah, in verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and say, God, to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. See, we can ask for wisdom if we lack it. They just give men liberally. But I don't mean he's going to answer each and every prayer that way, that he's just going to give you everything that you want. Whether it be a family member to live a little bit longer, whether it be a new job, an old job, career change, you got to always be in the Word. And ask God for guidance and how he wants us to lead our lives. And how he wants us to live our life for him. And let his light shine through us. So many times I've often heard people talking about Patience. Trying your faith work is patience. Well, I read a book once. This lady said she prayed for patience, and her girl got the chicken pox. And she said, No, God, you're not understanding. I want patience. And then another event, her husband, I think, got sick a few weeks later. Again, No, God, I want patience. Sometimes we just got to open our eyes. He's giving us what we're even asking for. We're just looking in the wrong kind of containers. He was teaching her each time, giving her things she had to be patient with. A lot of times you have to learn hands-on. That's how you learn. It's not enough for me to watch, say, one of you lose a family member to understand how you feel. I cannot know until I lose that same family member. That's why you see the special bond amongst people when they go to a funeral or something. If they've lost the same spouse or the child or a mother or a father. They know how each other feel. I can't relate to that because I've not lost those things. But Jesus Christ and God came. They've come into this world. Jesus came into this world as all, all man and all God. And he took on all the burdens of everything. He was tempted. He had a friend die because he resurrected him. So Lazarus come out of that tomb. But again, that was for the purpose of God. That was for God's will. Just remember all these things when you go out today and throughout this week. The trials and tribulations hit you who to turn to. God, give me another instance this week that he let me learn that same lesson. I had a guy to come in my work cell. And I'll tell you what, I've never heard so many curse words in my life. I didn't even know they all existed. This guy was talking so much that he'd probably put sailors to shame. They'd be blushing. And I worked with him for about two hours that day, and I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I, I really didn't know what to do. I mean, because in the workplace, you can't just pray well tell him to quit. That's not... You're not allowed to do that. We've had people go to HR for that very reason, and all they'll say is, hey, we're glad you're a Christian, but you can't force that on him. So there's nothing really you can say or do. I mean, you might ask him politely, say, look, I'm a Christian, can you refrain from that? But a lot of times that just turns on the heat even more. So the next day I went into work and said, God, something's got to be done out here. we got to do something. I said, I don't know how to handle this situation. So he just put it in my heart that morning to start singing. <coughs> yeah, I comes in the work cell and start singing. I sing Amazing Grace and, I don't know, several different songs that I know that's in the, the books here that we sing. And, and a few of the ones I know that from the Christian artists that I listen to. And I started singing them. I wish I didn't hear five curse words all day. But that's because I put my faith and trust in God, and He gave me a way to, to get, get through this. And He'll give us a way to get through all this. The denial, the anger, then we go into bargaining when we get sick. Don't we always do that? Ain't that wonderful? Oh, God, let me get healed. I'll, I'll be to church next Sunday. And then we get depressed when, we, when the reality starts really setting in that we may not make it. And then there's acceptance at the end of the five stages of grief. We finally accept our faith. But it's a lot better to see, and a lot easier for you, and a lot easier for your family to accept the faith of no matter what happens to you. 
you can look into. What a great plan to hand, hand, hand down to your to your loved ones. To be an example to to your brothers, your sisters, your moms, your dads, grandmothers, grandfathers, whoever you have left that's still here with you. What better to give them a plan of salvation? <clears throat> to give them a hope in eternal life. That they too may live sin free and endure to the end. And we can all meet up there and have a big party up there. Because they will be rejoicing and singing in heaven. And like the welling and gnashing of teeth and the burning that results in hell. Today as we sing uh, Psalm 350, you'll have that choice. <coughs> you heard the word today and you believe it and you want to repent. Come forward, you can confess Jesus Christ right here. And we'll get you baptized and start on your way to living your life to the Lord. You need a church home? Not mandatory, but you can put your membership in here as well at this time. You can let us know. And if you was a Christian and you've lost the way just a little bit, all of us stray every now and then. We lose our way. Maybe you've lost it too far and you've strayed quite a bit away out of the hedge that God has put around you. You can return at this time too. You can come forward and tell us and we'll all rejoice with you or you can simply sit in your seat or stand and say, God, I want you back in my life and let's live for my life for you for the rest of my day. Until the end. You sing song for